Deb's talking tonight, yeah. She's got a lot of things. Two, five. One guy came from Alberta, is what they said, where it all started from. He went to like three different work sites and infected all of them. That Brazilian COVID case, I guess he was from Alberta and he was traveling for work and something about, that's something like that. We have the most cases of that variant outside of Brazil, just BC alone. It's pretty crazy. Okay. Call the meeting to order. I want to recognize that we are on the traditional unceded territory of the Nakotan of the Indian Land. And I move we do adopt the agenda. So moved. Second that, Mr. Mayor. Is there any motion or any uh, business or any waivers? Okay. Adoption of the minutes from the March 15th regular meeting of council. I'll make that motion, Mr. Mayor. Second. Any errors? report is just information for the most part. Um, the council's uh, obliged to review um, and endorse the list, but by no means um, do you have to accept the list. Um, the fire department makes or goes through an election process, um, and in the past it's been every year, and it's, and it's directed by the fire chief. So uh, the list of names that are before you are those that are endorsed by the fire department to um, take and, and represent in those roles. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this uh, is a uh, administrative um, report. Uh, the report or the um, um, existing mutual aid agreement with the RDOS expired, and uh, this is a process of putting it in place while um, the RDOS uh, renegotiates and develops a new. Um, document for all the fire departments to proceed with in the future. So there's no changes? There's no changes. Okay. So we have a staff recommendation that the fire aid agreement between the Town of Princeton, the Regional District, Okanagan, Samokameen, Town of Oliver, Town of Asuyas, District of Summerland, City of the Improvement District, the Oliver Fire Protection District, and the Asuyas Rural Fire Protection District be extended for uh, for a further one-year term and that the mayor and CAO be authorized to execute the agreement on behalf of the town of Princeton.
like to sign with the Aris Fire Department. They are a recognized um, department within the fire structure um, to provide a similar level of service as what Princeton provides now to the fire protection area we um, uh, service. Um, this agreement would be reciprocal. Uh, we would, um, uh, if needed, assist Aris Fire Department and like likewise they would assist the fire department here. The next closest dep department that we rely on is um, in uh, Karameas uh, with like uh, training and equipment. Um, other departments like Tulamine and Headley do assist but they just usually come with manpower. Um, they don't come with the extra equipment. Um, so this agreement would be similar to the service that we receive from Karameas. Any questions? Okay, we have a... Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, for clarification, I see it's for 14 months. What is the significance for that? A 14-month term is to allow time for the RDOS to um, sign ARIS. Um, in, in the previous agreement so that we can extinguish this one. Thank you. Yeah, the one we just approved. They, ARIS isn't part of that, so the, the idea was hopefully that ARIS would become part of that bigger mutual aid agreement, and then this would be done at the same time. Thank you. Okay. So we have a staff recommendation that the fire protection mutual aid agreement between the Town of Princeton and the ARIS Vol Volunteer Fire Association be approved for 14 months, and that the Mayor and CAO be authorized to execute the agreement on behalf of the Town of Princeton. Um. Councilor McLean, okay. Councilor Gould, any other questions? All in favor? Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Um, this this uh, request um, is born out of a necessity for um, wildland fire fighting equipment and access. Um, within a trailer that can be transported to um, locations in and around Princeton as well as Aris, uh, Hayes Creek and um, Tulamine. We're all um, uh, placing uh, financial contributions into the um, process and this grant would be in a, a request from the region, regional district for fully funding the actual trailer and then some some, some more uh, support equipment for the SPU trailer. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a, does anybody have a question of Ed? Okay, we have a staff recommendation that council approve, um, yeah, approve the purchase of the utility trailer and structural protection equipment for the Princeton Volunteer Fire Department for no more than 30,000 plus GST, subject to grant funding approval and that council allow staff to apply for the grant from the Vermilion Forks Community Forest Corporation, VFCFC, as sole source of funds for the purchase. I'll make that motion. Councilor Gould, seconder, Councilor Willis. Any further questions or comments? All in favor? <coughs> Carried, thank you. Point five, to support the Regional District of Okanagan Spokane UBCM Emergency Operations Center support grant application. Ed. Uh. <laughs> Your show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, this this is a uh, joint submission um, between several mu municipalities in the regional district uh, to support um, the emergency programs in each community and align all the community uh, training uh, to the same spot so that we're all um, able to communicate and, and transfer our skills uh, through each community. The um, one outstanding item that Princeton is applying for within that grant is assistance with upgrades to uh, the emergency uh, programs website that uh, we have in, in place cur currently, but it's not fully developed. So it would be $8,000 uh, we're asking for assistance in technical support to further expand that uh, website. Any questions? 
Okay, we have a staff recommendation that council support an application by the Regional District Okanagan Smelt Main to receive and manage a fully funded UBCM EOC support grant in the amount of $25,000 in coordination with the provincial or Princeton Emergency Program. Okay. Councillor McLean, <coughs> seconder. Second. Go ahead, George. <laughs> Councillor Elliott, any questions or comments? All in favor? Carried, thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, 6.6, .6, award contract, uh, official community plan bylaw review and update development cost charge bylaw. Mark. <laughs> oh, come on. There's another one for him. Okay. Um, as, as you know, our current OCP is from uh, 2008. It served us well, but uh, it is coming to the end of its useful life. Um, uh, so what, we, what council has done is they've put it out for proposals. We received three proposals. Uh, we, we have a budget for this uh, project of $100,000. Um, the proponents came in under budget, which, which is nice to see. The DCC portion of, uh, of this project uh, which is development cost charges. Uh, it's new for Princeton, but it's not new uh, in, in the municipal world. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're one of the few communities that don't have DCCs. And DCCs are used to, uh, to, to fund, or it's funded through uh, new development, and the funds are used for the infrastructure that, that supports the development. Um, and as I said before, this is a standard procedure um, with most municipalities. It would leave them with grants, it'll look better, right? We've yes. heard that before, that, right, that we haven't received some because of that, maybe? Yeah, exactly. Actually, the province uh, would like to see us try and help ourselves before before they, they help us. Yeah. yeah, we made a very clear plan for the funding. We the Perhaps just a second to explain to people what, what is a DCC, how does it work? Yeah, so uh, development cost charges, um, I, I might turn it over to finance, but uh, it's something that is attributed to an area and any development that happens in that area, then this, this is like a, a small tax that's taxed on that, that area and any development cost uh, goes into a fund and I'll let uh, finance kind of explain it further. There. Yeah, so, <coughs> so uh, it's attracted to subdivision uh, and, and building. So when somebody builds a new unit of something, so uh, you know, tears a house down, puts a new one up, or develops bare land, a development cost charge kicks in. It's a it's a special levy that's associated with uh, with the building of that unit. Um, it can be devoted to a very few number of things. It can be devoted to roads. It can be devoted to water, sewer, uh, schools, which isn't really germane because we don't really contribute. There's there's not really a long term development plan for building of schools in Princeton. We're pretty much uh, we got lots of capacity there. And parks. Uh, so the uh, the money is is collected. Uh, it is kept segregated. It's put directly into reserve. It's kept segregated and has to be reported to the province each year. And uh, it can only be used for future new development with quite a few strings attached to uh, to build those items. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the actual bylaw is set by. Um, us, but has to be approved by the inspector of municipalities. It's very, very, very strongly regulated. So, uh, so it's not as if we can take these fees and kind of build willy nilly. Uh, there's proportionate fees that we can take out. Similarly, come agreements that that this money can be used for parks or for roads or such, but related to new development only. So it's not really a pool of money we can draw from, as we see fit. It's more of a, uh, it's more of a contribution for new development to new things that come to the county. Perhaps the thought previously why this wasn't brought in earlier was that it, in a small way it discourages, it may discourage development, whereas now, as CAO said, everyone has it. We're the only ones that don't. So in other words, we're not doing anything that, it, that uh, everyone else isn't doing sort of thing.
my counsel a word of the contract for the preparation of the development cost schedule while I was still consulting in the amount of $30,000 for the security of the – So moved, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Elliott, seconder. I'll second that. Councilor Willis. I just had actually one question. But how, how long do they say that the process takes? It's quite a, it's quite a bit to it. Yeah. DCCs, they can take up to a year or more. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's quite an approval process. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Great. Thank you. Um, I'll just step out for a second. Oh, yeah. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty simple. <laughs> Pretty simple new uh, new subdivision that has a new road going in, and they've asked for uh, approval of Abbey Road. As their the question will be: Is there a crosswalk? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard rumors of crosswalks. Excellent. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, we have a recommendation to council approve the name Abbey Road for the road name required in the development of Old Brewery Heights located off Rockland Avenue as attached. So moved. Thank you, Council McLean. Second. My name. <laughs> Council, <laughs> Councilor Elliott. <laughs> All, are there any further discussion? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. It could have been Penny Lane. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. <laughs> and the park will be called Strawberry Fields. <laughs> Holy. Right. Um, okay, 6.6. .6. Oh, I already did that one. Uh, 6.8, 6 sorry. Uh, temporary patio program and sidewalk cafes. Mark, I think you've been working on this one. Yeah, within uh, conjunction with Gary, but uh, with the latest uh, provincial uh, orders, a few uh, local restaurants have asked what, uh, what we can do to help and, and a few uh, applications for sidewalk cafes and, and a few asking for some uh, ability to use their own parking lots and whatnot for, for outdoor seating areas. So, um, pretty simple. Uh, asking to, to maybe waive that fee for the sidewalks cafes this year and then um, support them how, how we can. So is this different from our the motion, the one we did last year where we waived fees? Same as last year. Same yeah. as last year? Okay. Perfect. Any questions, Council? Okay, recommendation that council waives the 2021 fees for sidewalk cafe permits in support of our local businesses, restaurants during the COVID-19 pandemic and that staff with business owners on a case-by-case -case basis to maintain a safe area based on bylaw number nine or 890-2014 and the guide to sidewalk cafes for the year of 2021 and that council support the use of temporary patios on private property of restaurants and takeout establishments if the liquor, food, and safety requirements are met for year 2021. I'll make that motion, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Gould, second her. Councillor Moore, Council Councillor McLean. Uh, any questions or comments? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. 6.9. Improvement grant application for 217 Vermilion Avenue. I believe this is our first one, Mark. Yeah, our first uh, first application that's that's come forward, and um, a recently purchased uh, building and, and new business going in um, has applied for uh, basically a facelift of the, the whole three sides you can see from Vermilion Ave. Uh, new siding, uh, window refreshed or refresh, lighting refresh. Applying for the the maximum five thousand dollars okay. for the uh, for the project. Perfect. Any questions? Yeah, Councillor Elliott. Not a question, actually a comment. Uh, I've been following the progress uh, that's been going on with this uh, site. Uh, uh, Ms. Phillip uh, has a Instagram feed, so I've been following it, and uh, what they're doing is amazing. They're just totally making that place brand new from the floor up. Nice. Yeah, they got it right away. It looks great. Yeah, it's, great. it's, it's great. incredible. Excellent. So would you care to pass it? I would be more than happy to well. pass that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're moving the rec staff recommended motion. Councillor Elliott, seconder. Second that. Councillor Willis, or Willis. Any uh, further questions or comments? Or? It, so it, has been, it sounds like there's quite a bit of interest eh, in, the, in the facade program. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and some uh, 
sizable projects for sure, and, and I think we'll we'll see a few more coming in the next couple of weeks. So. What, what was our limit again? Was it 20? 20, 20, 20 for the year, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Water and sanitary improvement project. Unfortunately, Jared's not here, so I'm gonna let Lyle speak to this. <laughs> I can, I'll, uh, I've got a bunch of notes here, so I'll kind of uh, just sort of relay the, the notes. Um, as you know, uh, staff has been working on preparing reports for council. We introduced them to you. Uh, although this is not a, a new problem, this is a, a problem that has been identified probably 20 years, or t 10 years ago, sorry, in uh, 2010, 20, 2011, 2012. Um, there were some reports produced that sort of identify some issues um, and as you know every time there's a major event like an election or a by-election or a referendum uh, the community brings this forward what about our aging inf infrastructure so I believe that the community is also concerned about our, our inf infrastructure um, we've had our engineer um, our engineering team uh, do a lot of work on this sort of evaluating and uh, and coming up with uh, options and recommendations on what it's gonna take to sort of bring everything up to date, get everything safe, get everything operational, uh, provide for some new fut future growth. And so they've divided it into two categories. Uh, one is uh, a water supply upgrade, and one is a uh, sewer system upgrade. And um, they've kind of prioritized a bunch of projects that um, are, are getting to be imminent. Like, um, like it, it's almost to the state where we can't, we can't let them go by too much longer. Um, I'll, I'll just sort of highlight them quick, quickly. Um, the first one is the Fenchurch lift station. Of course, it's at the end of Fenchurch. That is our, that's where our pumping station is to pump all the, all the effluent from town over across the river and up to our sewer lagoon. Um, it is something that is uh, easily done. Uh, it's not cheap, but it's, it's quick and easy. It, it means upgrading our power supply to the, to the building and upsizing our pumps, and then we can move uh, a, a bunch more product through, or product, I guess. <laughs> 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 Effluent. <laughs> and it would immediately increase our, our capacity. Um, we are susceptible to infill and infiltration um, there's, we have uh, charts that prove that when the, when the river level goes up, uh, our, our load on our lift station also goes up because there's people that are, are, are pumping uh, sump pumps into the sewer system. There's also infiltration into some of our piping that needs to be uh, updated. And so uh, there's peaks and demands where we're getting close to our full capacity there. And so, uh, but that's something that we can work on quite quickly. Those are seasonal. That's seasonal. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Force main. So once we once it goes through the lift station, it's got to cross that that river. Um, there is uh, we apparently there was a new uh, a new pipe put in across the river, and there is that replaced an old pipe. Um, unfortunately, that old pipe was supposed to remain in service, and it didn't. And so what has happened is uh, it was just simply shut off, and uh, there was effluent trapped in in the pipe, and that pipe now has been degraded with that, with that, with that uh, material in, in that pipe. And uh, so what is needed there is uh, they believe, the engineers believe that we can put a liner through that pipe. And uh, what that'll do is it immediately then would increase our capacity and uh, make our, our piping safe and also give us some redundancy so that if there ever was an issue with one pipe, we can quickly you know, put everything over to the other pipe and and uh, we, can, we can make repairs. So that would give us redundancy, which is very, very important. Um, Billy Minor Way to Tulamine Avenue. Uh, it was discovered uh, when we did a, a feasibility study to service the north side of Princeton, um, that everything would flow through uh, this area. And that pipe is only a four inch pipe, which is a, a residential size pipe. And so uh, it, it um, it really just needs to be updated be just for the existing use and uh, and also for fu future capacity. It's also near the end of its life, correct? Yes, it is. It's an old it's an old pipe, and that's probably why it's only four inch. Um, the uh, trunk main uh, from Fenchurch Avenue and Lime Street um, that is uh, a site that is very old. 
and it has a, a number of deficiencies and pinch points in it. And so uh, the proposal is to replace that pipe, uh, the full pipe all the way through, and that would uh, bring it up to the today's standards, and we would also upsize it to, to for, for, um, for future growth. From what to what? Uh, it was, it varies. It goes from 100 milliliters up to, millimeters, sorry, up to like 300. And so I think they're proposing that everything would just be replaced with a 400 millimeter pipe. So which, which is, is, which is kind of like. <laughs> 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 Thicker. Yeah. Yeah. 16, yeah. okay. okay. <laughs> so, and that would take our existing need and future need. And that's our main line that that's runs line, yeah. through the whole that's that right. side so of town. That takes correct? everything on the uh, north side of the uh, Tulumine River and brings it over to our Fenchurch Force Force Main. And downtown. And downtown, yeah. Yeah. Part yeah. of downtown. Um, then on the uh, water side, um, we have uh, three wells. They're called one, two, and four. I'm not too sure what happened to three, <laughs> but uh, we have three existing wells. And, um, and at times we are reaching. Um, capacity. We still have room for growth, uh, but um, we need to be planning for the future. And, uh, you know, if there ever was a major fire some, somewhere, uh, we, we, are, we are kind of restricted. So uh, the, the proposal is to drill a, another well, a new well, uh, upstream on the, on the Tulumine River, and uh, that would increase our water uh, for fire flow and capacity by another 50% uh, or whatever. Um, there is a, uh, a main booster station on Billiter, uh, basically between the uh, first and second bench. And what that does is take water from downtown and boost it up to the, uh, to the benches and the west reservoir. And um, that has, it's fallen into disrepair and it's actually become a, a, a safety hazard to even work in. And, uh, and we now know that it's actually not working uh, as it should, and um, a again, for safety and fire flow, um, that needs to be replaced. So that's kind of the, the project. The, uh, the, the total amount uh, for those projects comes to about $7 million. It's, it's a big number, uh, but it's something that uh, we feel, or the staff feel, that we're, we're getting to the point where we just can't let it slide any, any longer. And so, um, what we're proposing is um, is to uh, borrow to get this this pro these projects done. Um, it requires a lot of uh, approvals. Of course, the main approval is from the electorate. Uh, then it also goes to the uh, the inspector of municipalities, and it also goes to the regional district of Okanagan and Sunokameen. So there's quite a few levels of approval that have to happen. Uh, from start to finish, uh, to get the, the money actually available to us can take anywhere from 12 to 18 months. And uh, so the sooner we start this, this, uh, this, this project or this uh, application, the faster we would get the money and the faster we could start to make the repairs. Um, it should be pointed out that, um, that uh, this will impact the electorate. Uh, there's no question about it. You, we, if you're gonna borrow $7 million, there will be a cost to the ratepayer, um, but it's something that would not be bored by the ratepayer for about two years. So you, they wouldn't see it for two years. Council McLean, you had a question? I remember. Okay. <laughs> Bring to your attention, as you very well know, in 2011, these infrastructure problems were identified. Yeah. We are now How many years later? Ten. Ten years later, dealing with this. I just want <coughs> want you to be aware of that. Pr practices that were in ha were in place then, such as paving roads only after all water and services had been upgraded, um, went by the wayside for a while. I, I understand Jared's not here, but I understand we're back we're back to doing that. Again, um, the other thing you, you mentioned seven million dollars. A lot of a lot of that money is going to be coming from, or a certain amount of that money is going to be coming from grants, right? 
you know, staff have. Or is that just our portion? That that would be our portion at this point. That's that's the cost of the projects. We 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 do have an application in right now for eight hundred forty-four thousand, and we will continue to look for grants as well. <laughs> but um, you know, we feel that the uh, the urgency of making these repairs, we we, we can't wait for the grants to come come along. We actually have to. So that's fine. The other point is that we aren't borrowing $7 million all at once. We're no. borrowing it as we need it, right. as I understand. Yeah. yeah. So, so as, uh, as, as Lyle was alluding to, um, the, the loan authorization bylaw that is, uh, is in the agenda in, under item 10 um, is, uh, is to authorize the full amount. However, when we actually draw on those by issuing securities, that's the second half of the authorization that uh, Lyle was referring to in the process. Once the, uh, once the approval process um, is, is completed through the electorate and, uh, and the Inspector of Municipalities approves our, our bylaw, um, once the securities are issued, they can be issued in any amount up to the maximum. So um, as part of the request for, um, for tenders and, uh, and through the project management phase and the initial design phase, um, the, the amounts will be generated and projected over the course of probably three to four years to complete the entire project. And, and the other point is best case scenario, we're not getting a shovel in the ground for at least a year or 12, more. 12 to 18 months before the before the financing process is all completed uh, we still have to tender we still have to design we still have to um, we still have to figure out priorities of projects and which ones need to be happened now and which ones need to be deferred so um, yeah that's it's probably at least a two-year process I would think the other thing was that that in discussions with council we have brought forward the the fact that when you hear about a four inch line trying to service community, I have a four inch line in my restaurant. Um, that all, of, all the, the services that we put in, the water supply and everything else, build them for the future, don't build them for today or t you know, yeah. day after tomorrow. And finally, uh, last part, when you talk about what does it mean, what occurs when we go over capacity that you said you, as a result of a pressure what what's worst case scenario that happens when you say that well we actually had it had that tested to the max there in 2018 the spring freshet of 2018 um, we were getting dangerously close to a, an overflow in our in our Fenchurch lift station and we actually were um, contracting pumper trucks to actually pop it off take, take you know, take a, a volume out and run it straight up to our lagoons. And if, and the, and if the pumper truck couldn't handle it? Well, it's right by the river. And it would, it would spill out and, and possibly okay, into we're the still, river. yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Willis. And to point out, it's a low interest rate over how many years? Uh, well, well the, um, the, the loan right now as it would stand um, would be financed over 30 years. And uh, the interest rate currently from the Municipal Finance Authority is 2.29 percent. Anybody else? I want to thank staff. Um, this has been a priority, I think, of this council's since before we were all elected. And one of the things that we did ask staff when we were elected was to um, begin the studies to find out where we actually stood. And I know it's been a long time coming. Um, took longer than I think I wanted it to, but it's where we're, we're, we're at now. And uh, we know exactly where we stand. And uh, I want to thank all of our staff that have been involved in, in getting this to the table today because it's, uh, it's something we desperately need to, to address. So um, with that, I will ask that the uh, somebody move the recommended uh, um, motion that council authorize the water and sanitary improvement projects upon their inclusion in the town's five-year financial plan bylaw and subject to securing financing. Did you have something? I'll, I'll add after we. Okay. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Councillor Gould. Seconder. Councillor Willis. Uh, you had a 
comment? Yeah. Sorry. Just, just to speak Get it really, raise your hand up. I, I, <laughs> I can barely see it. <laughs> Which is mean. Um, this is something, as Mr. Mayor alluded to, that it's been a lot of work by the staff, and it's been something that, as a group, we've been wanting to address since we were elected. And it definitely isn't a decision that we're making lightly. It's not an easy decision. I still am sitting right about here <laughs> for, for where I can. And it's, when it comes to our, the priorities that Lyle mentioned, we as a group talked about those of what needs to be done even, like it's this much in total, but we need to at least work on this part, focus on this because um, safety of our employees is very important. Um, safety of our community, we have to keep the water and sewer separate. We've proven that in the past, it's important. Um, we have to keep our liabilities down and and we know that what the issues are now and thank you for staff and the urban or um, true. true for coming and presenting to us and, and breaking it down so even I can understand it. And it's important that now that that information is there that we don't just go, okay, well, the next group can deal with it. I think we have an opportunity to to deal with it now and to um, no matter who, when it started or what happened we know about it right now we need to to go forward with it even though it's not an easy decision Councilor McLean I'm just in agreement 100% I, I just think <laughs> water and sewer isn't the most elegant <laughs> projects to be involved in but I think fact that this is, we have had this knowledge for 10 years and nothing has been done to this point and we're biting the bullet whether no matter <laughs> how much we're looking at we're still biting the bullet and saying hey this has to get done we, can, we can't keep putting it off or else you're going to have a, a bunch of bad things happening in terms of, of how our how our whole system operates yeah Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Yeah, carried. Thank you. <laughs> Council reports. <laughs> you never make me go for it. <laughs> That's why I asked for volunteers tonight. <laughs> concerns me is when you get notice at noon that you're shut down for X number of days at 8 o'clock, I have to question the, the understanding of the government in terms of business. It doesn't make any sense. What harm would have it been done by once those numbers started to go up four or five days earlier? <laughs> If you just said we may be looking at a closure, all of a sudden I stop prepping food, I stop buying food, I prepare for it. If you call it off, it doesn't matter. I'll just go buy more food and I'll just prep more food. So you imagine the cost to all the restaurants in British Columbia as a result of this. I don't like I say, I being closed is the way it is. Uh, that's you have to, but maybe some common sense in terms of uh, dealing with it. And I almost wish that we could write a letter from our council. I'm sure it's been brought to their attention, but to write a letter to the government or to whoever's concerned saying, listen, perhaps in the future, don't worry about giving us a false uh, notice. If it doesn't happen, it's not a big deal. It's a way bigger deal when you snap judge it and say you're done today. Um, other than that, <laughs> the only other thing I can, uh, I have a hard time understanding is, but it must be scientific, but the fact that we have 800,000 people in the Interior Health District, and we had readings of 16 and 26 and 30 something for a while there. 
and we're getting shut down <laughs> just the same as the coast. As far as I'm concerned, I guess you can't do it because people travel and everything else, but that that is another B under my bottom. But I, I, I yield to that one to the scientific part of it. There's probably a good scientific reason, but as far as the notice, I don't see any reason for that business. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Willis. <laughs> Jumping all over now. <laughs> uh, I attended the special meeting of council on the 24th, I believe it was. And we can cut the board. You were there too, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my report. <laughs> <laughs> my oh, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Elliott. I left you some. I left you some. <laughs> Well, I'll take uh, Councillor Willis's extra time <laughs> and fill it. Uh, Tuesday, March 16th, I was at uh, Skill Centre uh, budget meeting, so uh, that was my first meeting there, and I learned a lot more about the Skill Centre than I knew before. Uh, Wednesday, March 17th, I attended a Zoom meeting for the Princeton Arts Council, and the Arts Council's done something really cool, speaking of COVID. What they're doing is they're actually doing a program called Silver Linings, and they're asking for people to submit stories about something good that has happened to them through COVID. So I think that's kind of a cool idea. Uh, Thursday, March 18th, uh, Princeton Museum Society meeting on Zoom. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to COVID, they've had to close the museum again. Uh, and so of course they're dealing with that. And I was also at the special meeting of town council on the 24th and 25th, along with Councillor Willis, McLean, Gould, and Mr. Mayor. And that's my report. Uh, thank you, Councillor Gould. So I also attended those meetings and that's where we got the education on the wonderful system we have. And in regards to Councillor McLean's comment, I think that people understand that it's not business's fault and I, th I think that's why we're supporting 100% to allow them to adapt if we can, if they can, even if it's in the parking lot or, or whatever we can do as a council to help our local businesses. What I've had to say to my children and to my family is that it's okay to be upset about her changes, but I'm not one to question who, like, it's easy after the fact to say what could have done better, and I think they're starting to realize that, but it's, it, is, it is what it is, and we all have to do what we can to, to try and stop it, or else this is never gonna end. It's gonna be a cycle that just keeps going, and and they've just got to encourage everybody to do their part and understand that a travel advisory is just that. And, and I think people are kind of making it their interpretation, which kind of affects everyone. And um, also I attended the online SOGA Thank you. <laughs> meeting on Wednesday, the 31st of March. So it's been busy. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, just gonna do the Coles notes here. Uh, 18th, I did the regional district board meeting. A April 1st, I did a regional district board meeting. Um, the SOGA speaker series is ongoing. I think there's one more to go. Um, we did get a response, and actually it's in here from uh, um, somebody, I forget who it is now, about the letter we sent in support of the allowable cut for our forced um, 8.6 yeah for our allowable cut um, I've talked to the MLA a number of times over the last month on a number of issues one of them being um, timber supply and whatnot as well so it's an ongoing thing um, yeah um, I understand everybody's frustrations with COVID I mean my family's doing the same thing they can't do things and it's it's uh, frustrating um, I will bring it up though uh, Councillor McLean uh, next time we have a um, mayor's meeting with uh, the member or with the minister um, that some uh, leeway would be nice <laughs> um, I know the the restaurant industry uh, um, the the organization I forget what it's called they did have some complaints as well because I mean if like you said, if you would have known a few days before, you could have canceled some orders or stopped some orders from happening and it would have saved you some money. So um, 
I will bring that forward at our next uh, next time we have a chance to talk to the minister. So, and those seem to be fairly regular these days. So, um, that's what I'm going to leave at my report at. So we'll go into uh, correspondence receiving file. Uh, we have 8.1 through to 8.7. I do want to mention uh, 8.5, which is WildSafe Provincial Coordinator, and we did get a letter from them saying that we were successful again with our community application for WildSafe uh, BC Community Coordinator, so that's good news. Um, can we get a motion to receive and file? Councillor McLean, Councillor uh, Gould, any questions or comments? All in favour? Carried. Thank you. Bylaws and resolutions. James, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with number one, fees and charges bylaw. Okay, so uh, so the uh, 2021 fees and charges bylaw, which was introduced at the last <laughs> meeting, uh, we're asking for a third reading and final adoption. Um, usually you can't do third reading and final adoption in one meeting, but uh, we are currently under a ministerial order that allows uh, fees and charges to be passed under a single meeting. Uh, in general, um, as was discussed in the budget process and during the budget presentation, um, fees and charges roughly go up 3% to sort of cover the increases in uh, labor materials and subcontractors uh, that uh, the municipality is expected to face in 2021. Um, and uh, that's what we have to report. Uh, any questions from James? Councilor? Well, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar on like processes but if the recommendation that's written I have a amendment I'd like to propose to the bylaw so and I've forwarded it to you know, do I make the motion read it all out can we continue if we well the uh, the uh, bylaw is to second reading right now so yes. it can be amended the, the schedule can be amended with the with it with the, uh, with the, at this point, and then third reading and final adoption can happen as, as necessary. Okay. So, so do you want I can to speak to my reasons for the recommendations, and then I can make the recommendation, which would you prefer? Yep. Floor is yours. Floor is yours. Okay. So, last meeting I had expressed my um, reservation with the amounts that were being proposed um, specific to Schedule G, the municipal campground. I've had the opportunity to get more information from Director of Finance, and as well this afternoon, I was able to speak with Director of Economic Development, Gary Schatz. Um, and I wanted to, as I said before, convince myself that so that I can understand why. So I got from Economic Development that um, it's, before it used to be contracted and it used to actually ca cost the town money and that there's the ability within the, the way things are right now, there's a lot of travel and Gary goes to um, conventions and conferences and is, it's recommending that this is going to be a commodity that you can um, vary your pricing on and do it based on supply and demand. And and I understand all that. I think that's great. I also admire the fact that I'll be admitting that last year I was skeptical on the increase in rates. Like I thought, oh, are people gonna pay that? They did, and it was very profitable. Gary was able to prove that that could happen. And the, the reservation I have is in um, the recommended bylaw is just at a maximum and in on the community or sorry BC government page talking about community fees and charges municipal fees and charges it says that local governments have a broad authority when establishing a fee structure including basing a fee on any factor specified in a fee bylaw which is what we're doing establishing different fee rates in relation to different factors establishing terms and conditions for fee payments, for example, discounts, interests, and penalties, and in certain cases, applying a fee outside the boundaries of local government. However, and then it states, a fee amount must not be excessive. Instead, the amount of a fee should be sufficient to recover costs of a service and ensure its future st sustainability. Fees are generally applied on a user pay basis, so only those who benefit from the service bear the fee. 
and to ensure transparency, local governments must make available to the public on request a report showing how a fee was determined. So my concerns with that, I, I support that it is, you know, the director should have the ability to offer a discount if necessary, or when it reaches capacities, it's good business practice to um, add a surcharge at that at 70%, 80%, or 90%. However, I still was stuck on the 200. So I had made recommendations um, in the report that was given to everyone, I can read it. The motion that I would like to make um, gives clarification so that we can provide that transparency and the fee structure on how do we determine our fees. Um, and, and again, like giving the ability for increases. However, we do as a council need to review our fee schedule and that's something that we could look at our policy going forward on how do we want to do that recommendation from finance was um, possibly doing a three year fee structure at a time so you don't have to review it in depth every year and would give the latitude to the directors of the varying like for example um, not just the campsite has commodities, but also the info center sells product too. So, so it's something we can go forward, but just so that we can pass this on third reading, my recommendation, done so, uh, that the following amendments be made to the fees and charges bylaw number 998, 2021 be made to schedule G, Princeton Municipal Campground user fees, and that third reading be given. Mm -hmm. And on there, would you like me to read each line or just? Just. Um, it's, it's basically a marriage of what our existing 2020 um, fee structure is and a marriage of the recommendation that the director wants to be able to have discretion to offer discounts without having so to this, come to council. This is what I gave you earlier. And then the recommendations on increases for this year's rates from last year and allowing um, the uh, option for additional fees when they're at various capacities. So we have a motion put forward. If we want to speak to the motion, somebody has to second it. And if nobody wants to second it, then the motion will die on the floor. <coughs> so I'll second it because there's, I don't understand what's going on here. Um, you, you mentioned uh, we're something at a maximum. I can't even read my own writing. So to that on um, page 194 of your agenda, it's page 10 in the bylaw, the rates are set to a maximum. Those are the maximum amounts that the, they can, the director can charge at the campsite. So it gives him leeway to decide Um, within that rate structure that he's got set. What Councillor Gould is proposing is on the handout that I gave you guys, and that would be a set rate with, um, which I guess would be the set rate. Um, these fees in the schedule are considered maximum fees. So, so that would be a maximum so they could charge up to those prices. And then there's, uh, in the yellow, you'll see it says if there's 70%, 80%, 90% book, there's an additional fee that can be attached to the maximum to cover that. And you're all right with that? Yes, and I took the fees, the maximum fees, based on what is the proposal for this year's fees by the director. Um, James, is there, is this, is it, like, does it fit within the? It is acceptable. Providing yeah, we, any so, typos. So, so first of all, me and Councillor Gould had a, what I would label a very productive conversation this afternoon regarding the, uh, the the proposal that was made, um, the, uh, the 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 kind of the uh, methodology that staff used when we proposed the bylaw was to set a uh, a higher maximum and and uh, and be able to drop the fees from there. Uh, I don't think anyone realistically is going to think that someone is going to pay two hundred dollars a night to stay at the campground. So the fact that um, the maximum is dropped is probably a, a fairly uh, a fairly moot argument, so I don't see a big problem. Um, there there are 
extra costs that go in the higher the capacity goes, not necessarily just an economic argument, but um, you know, having that many people in a confined space. If the, if the campground is full, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Gary, it's 80, 86 sites? 80, 74. 74 sites. So if everyone has three or four people in a campsite, that could be upwards of 300 people in a fairly confined space in the middle of the night. And, uh, and uh, you know, it would only take one or two rowdy apples and, and we may need security, we may need uh, extra extra caretakers, we may need extra cleaning crews. So there are very foreseeable extra costs that could result as a, a in, from a 10% full campground than a 99% full campground. So I don't, see um, charging more for higher bookings to be an unreasonable uh, an, an unreasonable thing. Um, the the argument behind a $200 a night fee is definitely one that might be uh, room for debate. Um, perhaps we uh, we overreached the staff a little bit in our in our uh, zealousness to be able to, uh, to to make that much more money for the residents of Princeton but uh, um, the, the proposals as I see them on the, in the amendment are not outside the, the, the realm of uh, outside the realm of what we can uh, sustain the campground for. Council Can Director Schatz uh, have anything to say about this? Uh, yeah, I <coughs> So the, the fees were put in there just the similar as if you were booking a hotel was the thought process. If you go into any hotel, you look on the back of the door you can see a maximum rate that's on there. Very rarely will you see that maximum rate charged, but there are circumstances that do dictate that they can charge that rate, used depending on events or happenings in an area. So the thought process was, that's a maximum rate. We have that ability. Um, I, I like the idea of it being open. I'm not saying that we should charge $200 a night by any stretch of the imagination, but I think if the opportunity presented itself, say we had Olympics, and there's events going down here, everything is gonna be booked solid. We're gonna have a campground that has Wi-Fi, fiber, like these are all getting added into it, upgrades to our service. It will be a desired commodity, and I would hate to handcuff the town by only having a certain amount as set in stone without having that ability to, to be able to do that and take advantage of that, because that is an advantage to our taxpayers and our tax base. And you've said other campgrounds are running the same kind of system? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a common system. There's been a lot of research that I've done into this methodology. And I mean, you see every hotel, it's not, we're not doing anything new. It's yeah. Campgrounds are just adopting the ways that the hotel industry has been doing for years. I just gotta say, I think, I think you've done a great job and, and you know, everything is looking a lot better than, you know, we were all a little skeptical when we, when we first took it over and, you know, it almost cost money. You know what I mean? It was, it was almost a hassle before and, and since I think it's been, so I have no complaints. Council McLean, did you have a comment? Bill, can we boil down what what is being proposed to change from what was, is it simply the $200 maximum thing is being boiled down to that you can charge 20 and 25 and, and 50 as in, in relationship to the percentage of book, how booked you are? So under, under the amendment that was proposed by Councillor Gould, um, the, uh, the maximum under what was proposed in the original bylaw was 200. Uh, this appears to be a maximum of $105 for, the, uh, for an RV site beside the river on a weekend if the campground is more than 90% booked. So that's, quite that's, that's a fair <laughs> <laughs> cutback. May I speak to that a little bit yep. more? Um, in regards to if there was a major event, granted that it would be most likely that we would be aware of it, that we could then have within a two week time frame or anything, or call a special meeting with council to make a resolution to amend it. If there was a major event, that would allot for that. But at this time, in, in the eyes of transparency and being able to meet that requirement of your fee structure, as a municipal ran campsite, we need to be able to set our fees in a bylaw and, and, and still allow for the business, the economics. And I understand, and I also have said, Gary's done a great job with that. I 
Last year, I didn't think we were going to do well with the rates that, that surpassed it. Like, there's money there to improve it. But I'm just saying, in the eyes of transparency, not to just have it set at just 200 with where's your rates for this season or that season. How long does it take to uh, amend a bylaw? Because that's what we would have to do, right? Amend the fees and charges bylaw? Well, the council can exert its will by bylaw or by resolution. So once, once the bylaw is in place, for example, we just with the sidewalk cafe, we waived fees. We changed the $150 fee to zero by resolution. So if, uh, if, if necessary, uh, we should be able to modify a, a fee by resolution if necessary. If there was an event that we would want to capitalize on. Or what if it's just very busy? Yeah, that's, it's just like it's supply and demand, right? If, uh, well, that's I, I don't think it's excessive if it's... That's where I'm coming from, from yeah. the point okay. of view of... I'm just saying it's not very transparent. You keep talking about transparency. Who are we being transparent to? If somebody was to ask how your fees were set, me? Within your bylaw, how are your fees set? So it just says up to maximum. And I understand too, it's so that he doesn't have to come back every year to increase rates as we are now, right? Reviewing rates annually. No, this, this is for one year. Right, but that, the explanation given to me was. No, he'd, right. we'd still have to do this again next year. Yeah. That we wouldn't ideally charge 200. He just, to have that, I'm just saying, let's rein it in is my recommendation okay. to specifics. Well, and those are the rates that are on the site right now. I, I would have thought that the, the people, if they thought the rates were too high, they would go somewhere else. Um, they have that option. We're not forcing mm -hmm. anything. And I, I bring to your attention, mm -hmm. <laughs> local governments have broad authority when establishing a fee structure. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, if we charge market price, how are we going wrong? So then you would argue that two hundred dollars is market price. It it can't be Sometimes excessive. Sometimes it is. I would I would argue. Right. Yeah. I think that right. There's places on you know, long yeah. weekends or, or events. I bet you all prices go up anyway. Right? Is this along the the two hundred dollars? Is that along the lines of the, the ones you've investigated? Yeah. I mean, if you see some resort communities, this wouldn't be unheard of for them to put a fee in like that. Like a, you know, areas like Tofino perhaps would have, they would have that ability. It, this just gives us the ability to do that if, if it's there. I mean, will that happen? Maybe, but you know, likely, probably not. But I would hate to not have the ability to do it. Is my the same? Like I said, as the hotel industry, the RVing industry is is moving towards that same framework. They've seen the success that the hotel industry has had with with these maximum rates. In terms of excessive, I, I would argue that what is excessive? I, I don't, to one person something may be excessive, to another it may be very affordable. And, um, and, and, they, and, and we are giving them the option there. You know, it's just, this is a commodity that we have. And, yeah. and the key in the legislation is also justifiable. So, you know, if, if we did have a night where we had a full campground, but you know, the police had to be called and, and people trashed the place and, and it, it became a, uh, the next day we had to send in public work crews to clean it out or we had a storm that went through there one night and everyone had to leave and we had to do excessive cleanup. It, yeah, you could, you could run into a situation where you'd have to charge a higher fee to be able to recoup those, those, those amounts. Plus there's reserve for future amenities. if. Uh, if we decide to uh, to improve the campground beyond uh, the way it is now, the outbuildings are kind of, uh, um, you know, the washrooms have seen their their better days, and their office has seen their better days, and and so you know there's there's room for saving in a reserve as well. Um, like I said, the two hundred dollar amount is definitely a point of debate, and that's what me and Councillor Gould had a great discussion on today. But uh, but uh, there's there's justification both ways. It's not a simple decision. I just have a hard time taking money out of taxpayers' pockets. Sorry. Which it wouldn't. It already is. Those are the, his recommended fees. $105 compared to $200? At a maximum that he says he probably wouldn't ever charge. I'm just asking to narrow it down. That's, that's pretty narrow. Okay. I'm going to call the question because there's, there's a... There's a motion on the table. It's been seconded. 
So all in favor? Opposed? Okay, it's defeated. I'm greedy, I guess. <laughs> so, so we still have, you can still make a staff recommendation that the uh, Town of Princeton fees and charges bylaw number 998 2021 be given third reading and adoption. Council Willis. Seconder. Council McLean. Any questions or comments on this one? All in favor? Opposed? Did you get that, Mark? Okay. It's carried. Did you get my passing motion on Abbey Road? <laughs> uh, okay. <coughs> big one. Uh, oh, no, not the big one. Revenue anticipation bylaw. James, you want to speak to that, please? Sure. So uh, revenue anticipation bylaw was, uh, went through three readings uh, on the last council meeting. Uh, it's more of a housekeeping function to uh, ensure that uh, if we pass below a minimum cash reserve that we would be able to approach the MFA to supplement until we begin to receive uh, property tax revenue and utility billing revenue uh, from ratepayers. Um, several municipalities in the province have, have a bylaw like this. Uh, there's actually very few that do not. And uh, I'd ask council uh, to, uh, to adopt this uh, to be able to, uh, to uh, make sure that we meet our statutory recommendations from the province. Staff recommendation is that uh, council adopt the Town of Princeton Revenue Anticipation Bylaw number 999, 999 2021. Make that motion. Council. Yeah. Great, thank you. Tax rate bylaw, James. Okay, so, uh, so the tax rate bylaw, uh, we uh, were required by the community charter to pass one every year by May 14th. Uh, the tax rates bylaw uh, matches our tax rate policy 2019 and uh, keeps roughly the same, uh, the same tax shift that we've had uh, and the same ratios we've had uh, for uh, several years. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's uh, interesting to note that uh, the mill rate will have dropped this year for residential purposes uh, as it has every year since 2017. So this will be our fifth year straight that it has dropped. Carried, thank you. Uh, Ten point. So, uh, so council in a uh, ninety point one uh, session. Um, uh, there's some land dealings that were not included in the original financial plan. Um, the amendment adds those um, financial or the uh, land purchases to the financial plan, um, paying with uh, land sales from the industrial park. Uh, there is no uh, tax implication in this uh, in this amendment. Uh, and I have received no feedback from the public uh, with regards to this amendment. Okay. Recommendation of council adopt the 2025 financial plan bylaw amendment 1, 2021 to 2025, number 1001, 2020. Make that motion. Councillor Gould, seconder. Councillor Elliott. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, 10.5. Twenty twenty one utility billing bylaw. Mr. Graham, again. Yes. <laughs> Up again. Uh, so the uh, utility billing bylaw um, was passed with three readings uh, during the last council meeting. Uh, staff asked that it be adopted uh, for uh, for this meeting. Uh, it sets uh, parameters and structure for um, our metering program for commercial and industrial properties. Uh, commercial industrial properties that have been fitted with a meter will be charged quarterly based on the amount of water they use. Uh, with the 2021 fees and charges bylaw that was just passed, that will be 72.1 cents per cubic meter starting on May 1st and any water usage after May 1st. Otherwise, it'll be 70 cents uh, from April 30th and before. Um, also, uh, also it, uh, it lays out, uh, we, we have nowhere under policy or bylaw 
um, specifically how residential and, uh, and non-metered uh, commercial for their last year of eligibility um, have been billed. Um, there's been kind of a procedure followed in the past, but this uh, codifies that uh, to make sure that it's actually passed by bylaw. <laughs> yes. We kind of jumped. Together. Yes. So, so in in section six, uh, a motion was uh, was uh, or a resolution was recalled from council to uh, proceed with uh, several uh, water and sanitary sewer upgrades in Princeton, which uh, Lyle did a, a fantastic job of uh, of briefing us on. Um, it was uh, it was largely proposed by staff that the majority of the funding for these projects come from a, uh, a, a loan authorization. Uh, as Lyle alluded to, it's a lengthy process. The first step in that process is to propose a bylaw and put it in front of council for, uh, for uh, three readings. Uh, after that, uh, the bylaw would go uh, to uh, un a, uh, uh, the electors, either through a referendum or an alternative approval process. Um, the alternate approval process is what staff recommends council go to, uh, but before that process happens, uh, the bylaw must be forwarded to the inspector of municipalities for approval. Uh, the inspector of municipalities' role is to ensure that uh, the municipality has a set borrowing limit. Uh, we can only borrow so much money. Um, it's measured through a, uh, a servicing limit, so we're basically limited to approximately 25% of our tax roll uh, can be used to service debt in one year. Uh, that amount equates out to about $866,000. Um, as proposed, the, uh, the bylaw would be, uh, would, would be approximately, would be under $400,000 um, to, to annually service that debt over 30 years. Um, once this uh, loan authorization bylaw would be approved by the electors and the inspector of municipalities, um, then we would, as, as Lyle alluded to, we would approach the regional district. Uh, all long-term borrowing must go through the regional district of Bimini municipalities um, for approval. Um, if they approved it, the MFA would actually loan the money to the regional district who would in turn turn around and loan it to us. Uh, security issuing resolutions can be all or part of the uh, amount, which is what Councillor McLean alluded to earlier. Uh, we would not be borrowing the full $7 million. Um, we would, as part of our design process and as part of our, uh, um, to, to get ready to actually perform the works, uh, we would, uh, and as part of our request for, uh, for a tender, um, qualified um, contractors would be required to give us a schedule of works and figure out how long it would take and when disbursements were required and we would match that to the amount of money we would request from the regional district in any given year. Um, so this is the uh, the first step to uh, beginning the process and uh, yeah, I will uh, I will allow council to uh, deliberate. During our discussion I it came across the, the uh, likeness to line of credit. Could, could you? So the, um, the, the loan process, the long-term loan process in British Columbia has two separate parts. So the loan authorization bylaw sets our maximum. So we're essentially asking the electorate to approve up to a $7 million borrowing limit to, pr to um, fulfill these water and sewer requirements. So that kind of sets our, our line of credit, so to speak, yep. uh, with, the, with the Municipal Finance Authority. Um, the security issuing, which is done through the regional district, is where we draw those funds. So if, if for example, we need a million dollars in 2023, we apply to the regional district to borrow on our behalf $1 million from the MFA. It's under that $7 million limit, but we're borrowing $1 million at the time. Right. So that's how, that's how the allusion to the line of credit works. You can borrow at any time, um, that's a little bit of a misnomer. 
the uh, MFA allows you to borrow in the spring and the fall each year. So it's not quite as easy as going to the bank and asking for a million dollars. It's there's a little bit of a process behind it, but the, uh, the the analogy still holds true in that we have a maximum amount. We don't have to borrow it all at once, as in a car loan or a, a personal loan, as you would think. That so we're bank. not paying interest on seven million dollars until we borrow it up to seven million dollars. As we use it, uh, we start to pay interest on it. That's correct. So. Once, once this project has the project, the requisite project management done to it, and and we're ready to uh, actually propose a, a bona fide plan of action to council, that's when we'll kind of propose a certain disbursement schedule for for council scrutiny. How how much uh, in loans does the uh, municipality of Princeton have out? Zero. How many? How much money have we owed in the past? In loans, zero. Well, it, it brings well up. Well, has some history, but yeah. It brings up a point that I was a mayor during the time when we bypassed opportunities as a result of not wanting to go into debt. How many municipalities in British Columbia, approximately, have loans? Uh, well, currently there are 162 municipalities in the province. Uh, currently, there are 13 that are debt free. So uh, there are there's there's one it's called Jumbo Glacier in the East Kootenays it doesn't actually exist so it's a it's a municipality in paper only it's on the side of a mountain so I don't know if they quite count but there's 12 active you communities. don't get to count that one <laughs> <No>. <laughs> the, uh, the, the most of them are smaller communities uh, like us they uh, um, you know they're they some of them are resource based uh, some of them are on the island some of them are up north there's not a uh, that's geographic concentration. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, there's there's 11 small municipalities, and then there's the city of Burnaby, which also is debt free, which I found kind of interesting. My point being, we I have always been proud of the fact that we've had no loans. I I'm at a point now where I've I've restructured that thinking, in terms of how many opportunities have we had as a municipality to be able to get things done, but didn't as a result of wanting to keep that debt loan free business going and and as a result of that are we in a situation now where we knew 10 years ago we had a problem with our infrastructure and only now are we going to do something about it mm -hmm. and yes it's wonderful to say we're one of 13 I also have to say how do we stack up in terms of in with those other with the entire uh, bunch of municipalities and terms of, of uh, our readiness of our in infrastructure and and uh, as a result of that um, well I'm not used to it I, I couldn't support it more in terms of it's time to get something done and and to be fair to your to your uh, former self council McLean um, you know in the past interest rates have not been this favorable uh, ten years ago we were talking about interest rates in the 10 to 11 percent range to the MFA um, at that point, the recommendation might be wildly different than it is now at those type of interest rates. Um, at 2.29, uh, we we haven't seen these low levels of interest rates, which is almost at the cost of inflation. Um, so it uh, it it uh, I, I think I think the recommendation is sound based on that. So when we borrow this on this line of credit basis, are we in danger of that 2.9 increasing as we go along or it, when we say we want 7 million eventually will it all of it as we take it out be the MFA is considered one of the most um, one of the most a. secure yeah one of the most secure investments in the world definitely within North America um, their their bond rates are one of the lowest yielding rates uh, that you can get um, because of that fact. Um, can the interest rate go up? Uh, the, the MFA will pay the interest rate based on what our security resolution is, not what our loan authorization is. So yes, the interest rate can fluctuate moving okay. into the future. All right. Um, since, we're, since we're probably planning on borrowing small amounts at any given time, 
Uh, we do have the once once a loan authorization is passed, if we if we take a look at you know future bond markets and we identify the fact that the interest rate is probably moving up, we do have the authorization to go to the regional district and pull all the money out and invest that. And if interest rates go up on the borrowing side, interest rates are inevitably to go up on the supply side as well. So we, we might be able to get a deposit rate that would be able to cover that interest rate differential. Okay. <laughs> good, good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Yeah, go ahead, Councilor Gould. I went on deep. <laughs> so one other point was on the, the cost per, um, for the community is based on per parcel whether it's an existing service lot or it could be serviced because mm -hmm. they would tap into our infrastructure. So, and that amount is based here. Right now at the, at the current servicing rate, um, the, the calculation uh, was $195 per parcel per year. Um, now there's a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, the $7 million is the maximum, and that was what was costed out by infrastructure for the project. Uh, if, there are, um, uh, if there are grants that end up coming through, if that $844,000 grant came, we wouldn't have to use the entire $7 million. So um, that would mitigate that number slightly. Um, if there's latecomer agreements, so if we build you know, sewer and water systems for um, a municipality that might grow beyond our current population as new development starts around Princeton they are the municipality would require them to enter a latecomer agreement and pay for some of those works which would also possibly reduce that $195 it's a it's a prerogative of council whether they want to leave that number at 195 and save into reserves for future infrastructure so um, loans in the future aren't required or um, future councils may want to drop that parcel tax in future years. Right. It's completely pay it up off. to them. Or pay it off faster by having it out that late. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing, I, hunt, I support this. Like I've said before, it's not an easy decision to make, but it's not like we're borrowing it for something frivolous. It's something that we need to do in for us. Not even about future, it's about for us. Like we're already, we saw the reports, we saw the feedback, It's we're at capacity. We have to do a better job of educating our residents as well for water consumption and saving water because we're our per capita was really high amount. And then as well, then that there's water going into the sewer, which is costing us to pump the sewer. So, so it's 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 a it's a definite need, not a want. So I, I had a conversation with uh, Minister Simpson a few years ago, and we were talking about I was trying to pitch him on couple of projects we were working on and uh, yes yeah, so infrastructure came up and he made a really good point he says uh, sometimes you need to mortgage your house <laughs> <laughs> in other words stop asking the government for money <laughs> um, and I think that that's a you know something we have to keep in mind here too um, we can't count on the government the provincial government the fact I appreciate the fact that the upper level government feels that we should be doing our own mortgage and everything else I hope that doesn't mean that we're going to stop chasing every oh, bloody we'll grant, every grant. <laughs> yeah. we look daily since, since our so. grant man is here yeah, right. no we're always looking for grants so we have a uh, staff recommending motion to move so moved so seconded 
Councillor Elliott. Any further comments? I call the question all in favor. Carry. one number seven uh, so uh, so this uh, this is proposed on this meeting uh, for for two readings uh, and that uh, as any revitalization tax by law uh, has to go to public notice so uh, this would have to uh, be published two issues in the paper before we could uh, before we could proceed on this one um, the uh, the goals of the industrial park revitalization tax exemption um, was uh, was to, uh, to to grant uh, properties within the industrial park uh, if they can uh, provide uh, provide employment, uh, they can provide uh, economic benefit uh, in a measurable and uh, and sufficient enough quantity to council uh, that we would grant them uh, tax exemptions for up to five years um, based on a petition process. So. Uh, the process would involve uh, would involve the proprietor of the business um, either petition by writing or by uh, in, in person uh, asking for this uh, making a, making a solid business case on uh, on what jobs and what economic benefit they would provide to the community um, if council agreed with them then staff would go through and uh, and monitor the process as they built a, an improvement on their land and as soon as they had occupancy and were ready to uh, to proceed with the business, um, the uh, the municipality would register their exemption with the BC Assessment Authority, and the the requisite amount would become exempt from taxation for like as I as I said before up to five years. <coughs> Correct. Yeah, it's not eligible for anything else. And, uh, this is not No, there's, there's different types of revitalization exemptions. Uh, some of them are for business improvement areas, some of them are for uh, downtown core, some of them are for industrial land, some of them are for farming communities and, and uh, agricultural improvements for ecology and environment and things of that nature. Um, some of them are for residential to fix up uh, certain neighborhoods or, uh, or, uh, or promote things of, of that nature. So there's there's many different types of revitalization that can happen. This one, uh, this one is specific to the industrial park. And uh, there's a question directed to Gary. Would it help sell It's it's important to note also that in the bylaw, if if it's presented to council, the the job creation and the economic spinoff, um, if if staff or council note that they are not coming through with their proposals, uh, the revitalization tax exemption can be cancelled at any time and it can be clawed back if it's found in the past they haven't met their uh, uh, met their uh, their uh, obligations as well. Well, I heard something about. Are we talking number of jobs to qualify for this? It's 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 kind of subjective. There's no there's no objective. You don't have to provide six jobs, or you don't have to provide thirty million dollars. It's it's based on their proposal. So if they propose five, yeah, to show an economic benefit to the community as a whole. That's correct, and convince council that it's worth it. You, for a, <laughs> for a bylaw, you're pretty subjective, aren't you? Um, well, it's it's. I think it's important to be a little bit subjective to this. It's, uh, um, you know, there there's some there are some companies that, you know, maybe they're only building a three or four hundred square foot facility and providing four jobs, but the actual amount of tax that the municipality would collect would be fairly negligible in the grand scheme of things. 
but it might be a burden to them. But you might have somebody come in who wants to make 400 jobs and need a much more substantial break. So it, it, it doesn't provide necessarily, and there are some that may provide no jobs, but provide huge economic spin-off for the rest of the municipality. So I guess in my mind, you're, you're op to me, you're opening up opportunity for dissent, right? In terms of, well, I'm much more beneficial to the community than, than, than Joe over there. Whereas if we had some sort of, I don't care if you had five jobs or, or $500,000 worth of building built, you, you qualify. Mm -hmm. I, just to say, well, who's gonna make this decision then? Well, council, I would, all proposals would have to go in front of council for their for approval. Good, okay. And jobs didn't really enter into it? No. Okay. No. Because, I mean, you could, we could have somebody, let's say, someone comes here and builds a lab and they have five people. Like it could be a $10 million building. Yep. You know, so it would be a significant tax. I just would, I just yeah. feel better that we have some kind of, some, yeah. And sometimes it's not just about jobs. It can be about local subcontractors too, who uh, who could receive economic spinoff. Yeah. Maybe they maybe they don't do employment. Maybe they they hire local companies. Maybe they you know support you know having booking the hotel every night for five years or something of that nature. Or they donate to lacrosse. <laughs> 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 Any other questions of, uh, of staff? So we have a uh, recommended motion here that uh, council approve or gives council gives the town of Princeton Industrial Park revitalization tax exemption bylaw number 1004-2021 two readings and that staff be directed to give notice of the proposed bylaw under section 94 of the community charter. Councillor Elliott seconded. Councillor Willis. Any questions on the motion? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Motion to close. Uh, in close to the public for the purpose of considering the acquisition of land or improvements if the council considers the disclosure could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the municipality. Okay. Council McLean, seconder. Council Gould, questions, comments? All in favor? Carried. Everybody out there? I'll call you, Andrea. <laughs>